So at work, I, I do a lot of Zoom meetings, and a, a little trick is you can put the notes in front when you introduce people, right in front of the camera, um, and people don't know that you're actually not looking at the camera, but your notes. So I get my notes right here, just to let you know, and you can see it. Um, my name's Craig Belinsky. Um, I, um, by the way, thank you for those praying for us for, for COVID. We, we've been out of quarantine for a couple weeks. Um, we've been careful, but uh, everybody's fine now, uh, although some are with poison ivy now. Um, I was a, a student, late 80s, early 90s, at Central Michigan University. I was part of his house. Uh, I actually lived at the campus house there at Central. And um, about after I graduated, about 10 years later, I was asked to be on the board. And I've been on the board now 20 years this year which has been interesting. Um, it's, we, we meet six or seven times a year. We actually have a retreat with the board um, one day in November, and uh, that's always pretty exciting. And, and it's always different. Uh, meetings are long. We just had a meeting, uh, Scott and us. We, we did this virtually for the last year you know, over Zoom. So his house is on 12 different campuses uh, in Michigan. We have a staff of, of 30 ministers, or over 30. My, my numbers might be off a little bit. Um, there's three supporting staff in East Lansing that actually supports all those campus ministers throughout the state. The, um, there's 16 campus houses. Uh, the 89 students uh, live in them. This is, um, this is interesting because it's kind of a, a a shining beacon in a, in a college campus. People, when I was there at least, they would actually walk on the other side of the road because they didn't want to be right next to his house as they walked by. And we would just wave as we were sitting on the porch or, or on top of the roof. Right now there's hundreds of students that meet on campus uh, houses or on, on, on the campus. Uh, or um, they meet virtually this last year. One of the questions I always have is why is his house on missions? You know, why, why is it part of the mission board or, or part of, of that? A couple of good reasons. And, and think about of a place in America that we can reach the rest of the world. Where students come and, and go back to their countries as doctors, as teachers, as engineers, as business people, developers, nurses, doctors, leaders. Well, that's why his house is here. We, we really focus, and, and recently, we actually have two full-time people working as international campus ministers, and one half-time person. And then on other campuses, there are um, campus ministers that really focus on that, not necessarily full-time. But, but it, it, it's interesting, because even when I was there, we had people who were from Okinawa, from China, from different places that became Christians, and then they went back to their country. And sometimes, you know, these are closed countries, you know, from the Middle East, um, that, that we won't have a chance to send a missionary, but we do at the university. And so I want to introduce Scott. Scott is leading uh, his house for the last two, year as direct, two years for director. Scott was a student at Michigan State involved in his house. He then became a campus minister um, at Michigan Tech for 20 years. Um, and then for the last two years, he's taken over as the director uh, in, in East Lansing. He is responsible for um, mentoring and helping other campus ministers, as well as doing some fundraising. And he's here to share with us some of the things that's going on at, at his house. Uh, please welcome Scott. Successfully turned this on. I did, yes. Excellent. Um, I just had to do a little bit better than Craig. That was the goal there. <laughs> um, it's been fun uh, working with Craig, and I'm so glad he's on our board of directors, and so glad. I I'm so glad to be back here with you guys. I was here a little less than a year and a half ago, and I had a great time with you, and I I've really been looking forward to coming back. So um, thank you. This has been uh, excellent. Um, I'm here with uh, three of my children, 
Um, and uh, there we, there they are, they can wave. Uh, my, my wife and my oldest are at home because my oldest uh, is in the band for the graduation, um, so she's got things to do. A senior or junior in high school, as you know, that gets a busy time. Um, good, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, campus ministry. Um, so I have a few things at the beginning, and then I'm just going to tell you a bit about how we think, how we do things in campus ministry, and my hope is that that's encouraging and challenging to you all. Um, uh, as it is to us. So first of all, I want to say a thank you. I think last week you showed a video. Uh, I think I might have been here virtually last year in a, in last week in a recording. Did you, was I? Okay, good. That's good. I, I don't remember it, but um, I'm sure I had a great time. Um, so I was telling you about this awesome thing we're doing. We're getting our staff uh, new computers, and that process has already begun, and you still have an opportunity to participate in that. As you know, more and more uh, having the right technology makes, uh, eases the ability to get out the message of Jesus, to build some relationships in ways that we've never had before. And really this past year, um, COVID and social distancing has really helped us uh, take hold of that. So uh, there's still an opportunity to do that, and I'll mention that uh, again at the end. I want to tell you about one other thing that we're doing, and uh, One of our campus, one of our 12 campuses is at the University of Michigan, which I believe is the closest campus to Brighton. Is that correct? Do you have any University of Michigan fans here? A few? All right, good. I I graduated from Michigan State, so I can't get my hand too high there. But tell you what I am excited about. I'm excited about students at the University of Michigan. I'm excited about them hearing the gospel. I'm excited about them being discipled into future uh, leaders who are going to lead other people to Jesus for the rest of their lives. And we have such a tremendous opportunity. So we've been there for 42 years. His house has. We have a campus house there. But the last few years, we haven't had um, a strong student presence. We've only had one part-time campus minister there, and we talked a couple years ago, and he said, we just, we need more people. We need to invest more at the University of Michigan. It's not a place that we can't reach. We're just not doing enough. And so, we are relaunching uh, that campus ministry, and so there's a video that's going to tell you a little bit about that. The University of Michigan is one of the most recognized and recognizable universities in the world. It's a gathering place for emerging leaders. It's a training ground for innovators and influencers who will go on to shape generations. And one of the most recognizable buildings on campus is right here, Angel Hall. Above its impressive limestone columns is an inscription that reads, Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary for good government and the happiness of mankind schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. But no amount of religion, morality, or knowledge will ever restore our world or offer people a lasting hope. So for the last 40 years, His House Christian Fellowship has served this campus by sharing the good news of Jesus' kingdom and the hope of His restoring power. And over the next 16 months, we're preparing and planning an exciting relaunch of our ministry here at the U of M. Building on years of experience, we're assembling and training a new staff team to engage today's students with today's challenges with the never-changing gospel of Jesus. We're asking churches and friends, students and alumni to help get us started by joining us at Cycle the Campus on June 5th. Together, we'll run or ride across campus to raise valuable financial support for our relaunch planned for September 2022. We need your help to change the world. Find more information or sign up online at cyclethecampus.org. All right, I'll give you a little insight to what we're planning there. And so, in addition to um, loving your help for computers, if you would like to help us relaunch at U of M, uh, we're having an event called Cycle the Campus. We have it every year. Uh, you can participate in it if you want. You can uh, ride your bike for 12, 36, 48 miles, uh, or you can uh, run a 5K, or you can do a, a walk and pray around University of Michigan's campus. Uh, and that is in two Saturdays from now, June 5th. Um, so you can participate. You can find out more at cyclethecampus.org. Uh, I'll mention that here again at the end. Uh, Well, as I said before, I want to help you understand how we at His House think and how we do things, uh, a little bit uh, 
a picture of the inner work things, and I think you'll find it uh, helpful and encouraging a- as well. And so, I, I want to talk about one thing first, and that is how we at his, his house think about the Bible, right? Um, so, we are a restoration movement ministry, uh, and this church is a restoration movement church. It's probably not something we talk about a lot. It's just about history. Um, but what you recognize probably is the same way we handle uh, the Word of God. We, we believe that the, the Bible is God's inspired Word. It tells us what is true, uh, and it tells us what to do. I often tell people that what we do is we read the Bible and we do what it says. Uh, that's our, our simple perspective. Uh, of course, it is more complicated than that. The Bible doesn't address, address every single thing that we need to do in our lives. We don't, uh, it doesn't address every decision we need to make. Um, the Bible isn't going to tell me how much I need to eat for breakfast. Like, I had two donuts this morning. I think that probably was half a donut too much, right? Um, but I didn't read in the Bible about that. I just something I have to uh, uh, figure out. It doesn't tell me when or how often to brush my teeth. My dentist does that. Um, It doesn't tell me whom to vote for. Um, The internet tells me that. Um, It it doesn't tell me, um, you know, big decisions in your life. It doesn't tell you what you should do for your job. It doesn't tell you who specifically you should marry um, um, or where you should live. Uh, So, the Bible gives us the core. It gives us the foundation. It gives us the truth. But God has also given us uh, His Holy Spirit. Um, when we put our faith in Him, we repent, when we're baptized in Him, the Bible promises that, uh, that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And He's there working in us, uh, giving us power uh, to do what is, what is good and do what is right. And He also puts us in a community of believers, the church. And together, reading the Bible, um, paying attention to the Holy Spirit, uh, working things out together in community, we, we end up with a much better idea of how to, how to go about and, and live our lives. And so, that's a little perspective of, uh, of how we think about the Bible. Um, it's also important that we, we, we recognize that, there's, that no other writing outside the Bible um, is necessary. There's lots of good books, right? Um, you love uh, maybe you love C.S. Lewis. Maybe you love some, some other more modern writers. Maybe you like Augustine. I don't know. Um, there's lots of good writers, but no other writing stands on the same level uh, as the Bible. I-, I love this restoration movement slogan. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but the divine. Um, that's just uh, where we're coming from. Uh, another uh, perspective is, is uh, unity. Uh, we want to be united in our pursuit of following Jesus through what the Bible says. Another restoration movement slogan points to that. In essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. In all things, charity, which is, that just kind of rhymes. We would say love these days, but uh, 150 years ago when they were writing these things, they, said, they probably said charity. I don't know that for sure. But in other words, we, we unite on the essentials. When we read the Bible, we see Jesus is Lord. We see that He died on the cross. We see that He was raised from the dead. He did that uh, so that we could be saved from our sins, so that we could have the gift of eternal life, right? We just, those are just clear and plain things that we unite around. And uh, some other things, we're going to have some opinions, and we work together uh, in understanding those things better, but we give each other space uh, to grow. Um, a- another little perspective I have on that is um, I'm not going to believe exactly the same things 10 years in the future, right? Because I'm going to grow. I'm going to mature. I'm going to develop in my, my knowledge and understanding. Uh, hopefully, that's a good thing. And that means that all of us are doing the same thing. And so, maybe if we don't agree about something, um, give us some time. Uh, Maybe we're both wrong. (laughs) Maybe we're uh, just looking at things uh, from a different angle. Uh, But we give each other space. Uh, So, this is what we do in our campus ministry. Um, So, uh, I'm going to… I wrote this a couple weeks ago. I'll just read it. Um, We prefer to lead people, lead students to read and study the Bible for themselves so that their authority is God and not us, right? I don't want to tell you what's true. I want you to look to the the Word of God and see what's true so that you can be trusting Jesus and not me. Uh, We will challenge students' uh, contradictory beliefs. We will ask them to look at what Scripture says, um, but we want to to have them look at what Scripture says, that they're not confronted by us directly, but they're confronted by what uh, the Word of God says. Uh, However, I got to admit, sometimes what happens is laziness and impatience induces us to just tell people what we think that the answers are. 
Um, that certainly happens as well. Or, or just tell them what we think they're doing is wrong. But, but you, it's, it's a better way to show people what the Word of God says. Have them look for themselves, read for themselves, uh, and be confronted by Jesus directly and not us. Because I don't want to make followers of Scott. I want to make followers of Jesus. Does that make sense? So that's kind of our outlook. Uh, we also have a strong preference to talk about action over belief. In other words, if you really want to know what I believe, look at what I do. Does that make sense? Look at, look at how we do things. That tells you what we actually believe uh, and not just words that come out of our mouths. Um, we do serve a stu- students from a variety of Christian and non-Christian backgrounds, uh, but we don't, with, we don't hold back from engaging them in controversial topics. We will often engage students on topics such as baptism, sexuality, spiritual gifts, money, generosity. These are, these are all controversial things that people are going to disagree. But again, we're not necessarily telling them this is what's so. We're introducing them to what the Bible says so they can find out for themselves. Uh, we treat the Bible as inerrant far more than we actually teach that fact, right? I hope... Um, I don't know how well I'll do this morning, but I hope when you listen to me, you just know uh, that I believe that the Bible is God's Word, and it is inerrant. It's our sole source of authority, and I hopefully I don't have to tell you that. And so that's kind of how we interact with, with students as well. We want to uh, treat it that way. We, we constantly invite students to look to Scripture as their authority. Uh, we train them to adopt that, and we train them to adopt that attitude for the rest of their lives. Um, uh, we'll also help, help them see... Uh, help some students see that they can trust the Bible, demonstrating its reliability and goodness. Um, So that's just a little perspective, and um, I guess my hope is that's not a big revelation, and that's pretty similar to what's uh, what's going on here. Um, But I think how we think about the Bible, how we we treat it, really impacts the rest uh, of our ministry. All right, the second thing I want to share, and that is how it is that uh, we think about making disciples right? Uh, How do we go about making disciples? Uh, We have a mission. We have a calling. We have a gift. And as Paul says it, we have a grace from God. There's a a little bit in Ephesians 3 where Paul's talking about God's grace, but I like how he talks about it here. Um, He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister or a servant according to the gift of God's grace. Oh, by the way, God's grace. That is God's favor towards us. That is His desire to bless us. That is His desire to give us. It's the same root word as gift. So, gift and grace are really closely tied together. So, when He says, uh, this is the gift of God's grace, it's like, I am so blessed to be a servant of God. That's something that God blessed me with. And He, he says, which was given to me by the working of His power. So, God worked His power in us, enabled us to be His servants. That's such a blessing. Then he says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he says, I, Paul, I am the least. And saints, by the way, Paul's not calling himself something like an extraordinary Christian. He's just calling himself a Christian. A saint is just one who has been made holy uh, by God, which describes all who are followers of Jesus. And he says, I am the very least of these saints. Why does he say that? Probably sees some significant inadequacies in himself. Also sees a pretty rough history before he came to know Jesus. But whatever the reason, he says, I'm the least of them, but this grace was given. God blessed me with this thing so that I could preach or I could share with the Gentiles this unsearch- the unsearchable riches of Christ to bring to light for everyone What is the plan and mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So Paul felt that it was a precious gift from God to be given the task of preaching to the Gentiles. Um, And he he didn't see it as a burden. He didn't see it as something he had to do. He saw it as something that he was privileged to do. And and we at his house, we feel the same way, uh, that it is a privilege, it is a precious gift from God to be given the task of sharing the gospel with college students and helping them mature in their walk with Jesus. Basically, we have we feel privileged to have the opportunity to work with college students. It's the best thing ever. Uh, I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth here for a second, but then I'll try and recover here. So um, I remember uh, when I was first beginning in campus ministry and telling people about it, I was going to be, I'm going to be a campus minister at Michigan Tech. And people were like, oh, 
I don't know what that is, but you sound excited about it. That's awesome. Um, and then they would ask another question, which is, uh, so um, are you, are you going to like have a real church someday? Uh, and I was like, yeah, man, church is good, but what I'm doing, I, I just, this is my own perspective, my own calling from God. Like, what we're doing, it's better. <laughs> And that's not to put down the church. It has to do with uh, my and our specific calling to be with college students. It is a privilege to be called to go to college campuses, something we look forward to. I, don't, I think when Paul wrote this to the, uh, to the Ephesians, um, he said it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's God's grace to go to the Gentiles. I don't know that that many people would have been excited about that, Right? I don't think we feel that because we think, oh, we're, we're Gentiles. Obviously, he was privileged to come and tell, you know, come to us so that we could hear about it, right? Duh. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think in a lot, of, a lot of ways, a lot of people would be like, yeah, I don't really want to go to the Gentiles. That doesn't sound exciting. Why don't we just stay with the Jews? And why don't, we, why don't we share the gospel here where it's comfortable and safe? And Paul's like, no, I got something so much better. I'm so excited about it. And everyone looked at him like, okay, you, you do that, Paul. I kind of feel the same way about campus ministry. I mean, it's not the normal ministry thing to do. It's so hard to describe to people. And oftentimes when we're on campus with students, we want to say, hey, you want to come to his house? And they go, what's his house? And they say, oh, it's a campus ministry. And they go, what's a campus ministry? <laughs> and, uh, and, and we spend a lot of time um, trying to convince them of its value, which they can't even understand until they, they participate and join in. Um, so it's definitely an, an unusual thing, but it is a privilege, and all of us on campus feel that it is a privilege to do this. Um, uh, we believe, and in fact, if you want to look at what we feel our calling really is, it's, it's no less uh, than to reach every college student in Michigan with the good news about Jesus. I don't think God has called us to anything less. Are we doing that right now? No, we're not even close. <laughs> Uh, there's 500,000 uh, college students in Michigan. We're probably impacting 1 to 2,000 right now. That's pretty awesome for those 1 to 2,000, but we're pretty far away from that half a million students uh, that are out there. I, I have a dream, I, I would, I, and I, I don't know exactly how to get there. I know how to aim myself in that direction. I, I, wanna know, I want every college student in Michigan to hear uh, about Jesus from one, from one of their friends, so someone who loves them and talks to them about Jesus. That's my very ambitious and also yet uh, simple dream at the same time. Um, that's what I want to see happen. That's what I want to work towards. That's what I want to build his house up towards. That's why uh, we're trying to give laptops to the campus ministers to reach one or two or three or, or 20 more students. So that's why we want to relaunch at U of M because it gives us access to 40,000 more students uh, that we just don't have right now. Um, that's what we're aiming for. Um, you've heard of the Great Commission, right? Um, some, sometimes it's posted around. Sometimes I like to look around and see if it's like written on the wall somewhere. Uh, I, but here it is, and, you, and you should, this should be, should be really familiar. Go therefore, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, this was given by Jesus to his disciples right before he ascended to the Father. Um, so it's focused on the disciples. But I believe, uh, I believe that it is a commission for everyone. Um, even if you feel, like Paul did, that you are the very least of all the saints. Remember, Paul said he felt like he was one of the least of the saints. Even if you feel that way, um, I uh, am convinced that God's desire and plan is to use everyone in furthering His kingdom on earth, no matter who you are, great or lesser. Um, God wants to use you, um, and He can use you. Uh, I have a, a phrase I think of sometimes, God does not call the equipped as much as He equips the called, right? If we say, yes, I'll do it, um, He'll find a way uh, to use us. Um, when I went up to Michigan Tech, uh, after I was a student at Michigan State, um, I didn't go because I thought I was the best campus minister ever. I was fully capable of doing everything that was necessary. Uh, the farthest from the truth. I only know, knew that college students need to hear about Jesus, and I was willing to be sent. Um, and uh, I guess what I, what I experienced along the way is God enabled me to become capable of doing that very challenging task. 
Um, and there were many bumps and bruises along the way as well, so it's not like an easy thing. Um, so um, this, we often think of the Great Commission as a command. You should go do this, right? I don't know how, if that's how you hear it. Um, that's oftentimes how I, I hear it as well. Um, I like to think of it instead as an invitation, an invitation to a life of supreme purpose and ultimate meaning, right? A life that has purpose, a life that has uh, meaning, eternal value. Uh, just as much as we are inviting students to know Jesus and follow Him, uh, we're also inviting those same students uh, to join us uh, and Jesus on a journey of making disciples. Every student that we share Jesus with, every student we get to meet, we're, we're helping them uh, see the beauty and the, the joy of living out this great commission. We're inviting them to participate with us. We want to make lifelong disciple makers. We're not satisfied with just uh, telling these students about Jesus. We want them to know uh, how to share Jesus with everybody for the rest of their lives. Oh, here's a little plug here. So, one of the things I get excited about campus ministry is they graduate, and they're usually 22, 23 years old. They probably have 60 more years uh, to make other disciples. Does anyone here? Well, not very many people have 60 more years to make disciples. Um, some of us have more than 60 years, probably. Uh, <laughs> the kids in the seats. You guys, you got a lot in front of you. That's going to be exciting. Um, so, uh, we want to equip them to make disciples. And so, um, I, I like to analyze things and break things down. I'm an engineer. I can't help it. Uh, and so, uh, I have uh, broken things down into, into six steps that I think will be helpful. They are helpful to college students, but might also be helpful uh, to all of us here in the, in the how-to. So, this is just a little how-to guide in making disciples. Maybe it's obvious, but hopefully it'll be uh, encouraging. Um, so, here's a few thoughts to do that. The first step is go, right? That's how Jesus starts off the Great Commission. Go, therefore. Um, starting point for making disciples is meeting new people, right? You have to meet new people if you're going to make more disciples. That's certainly collectively true. If we in this room want to make more disciples from people outside this room, we have to go meet them. Um, uh, it's a simple principle. I am here. People are there. I must go from here to there. Um, and that's a very simple concept, but is that easy? Is it easy to meet new people? No, it's, I mean, in theory, it should be, right? There's me, there's you, I say hi, they say hi back. Um, man, we, I met somebody. Uh, but it is, in fact, uh, a challenging thing. Um, I'll tell you with you my, my biggest struggles uh, with that. Um, I have two, and one is busyness, and the other one is fear. Uh, I fill my time with tasks and already existing relationships. Not bad things, but I don't tend to leave extra time where I can go and meet new people. Um, I'm also, when I am around other people, sometimes I don't even notice it. Um, uh, here's a, a funny story. So, um, on my way home from Western Michigan uh, on Wednesday, I was a little bit hungry. I thought, I should stop and get some food. I saw an Arby's. I went to the Arby's, and you have to do the drive through and um, I thought that was kind of fun because actually Lillian, our, our oldest uh, daughter, uh, works at Arby's, working the drive through window. And so I just thought about her, and I thought, oh, man, it'd be nice to bless this, um, this, this young woman who's uh, at the drive through window. And um, I was actually kind of proud of myself that I even thought of that as a person with feelings and a day and, like, things that happen to them, right? I don't know, do you struggle with that? Like, you just forget that people are actually people and they're really experiencing life just the same way we are. So, I was really proud of myself for, um, for remembering this. It's like, oh, what should I do? And, and um, I had these, um, so I have these You Are Loved magnets, which I have for all of you if you want them as well. I'll tell you more at the end. Um, so, I had this, this pile of magnets next to me. Next to me. It's like, oh, yes, I'm going to give uh, this, this, uh, this woman, I didn't know her name, um, a, a, a magnet. Let's just think it has a good message. You are loved, right? Like, that's just something really basic to make her life just a touch better. I don't know that we'll ever see each other again. Uh, and so, I, I reached out the window, and I, and I was going to hand it to her, and then it dropped, and then, um, 
I was like, oh, no, and I'm in the front of the line, and then I opened my door to find it, and I felt around, I couldn't feel it, and, and then there's people behind me, and, I, and actually, you know, I was up close to the doors, so I couldn't even get out of the car, uh, and so then I realized that I was just being a nuisance, and I was in the way, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll get out of your way, and I drove off, and I, and I ran over the magnet. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't always go smoothly, I'm just, just saying that, Okay. Uh, sometimes life doesn't, doesn't treat you well. I don't know what God was trying to teach me through that. Probably um, humility um, uh, is usually one of those things, right? So, but I, some, I just felt like I took a step there, and uh, I just encourage all of us to, to do that same thing, um, to notice people, and busyness gets in the way of that. The second thing I struggle with is, is fear, right? Um, I also struggle with an irrational fear that people out there won't like me. Anyone struggle with that? Anyone, like, think of the idea of being up front and talking to people as, like, crazy scary? Because, like, you're not going to like what I say. What are you going to think about me? I'm putting myself out there for you to see, and you can have an opinion about me, and I'd really much rather hide and, and not have you notice me at all, um, right? That's not an unusual fear. We're kind of all in that same boat. I don't like uh, being up here uh, because I like being up here. I like being up here because I have, think I have something that will benefit uh, people, and I'm willing to, to risk your dis- disfavor and displeasure um, by being up here, right? So every time, I don't know, every, you think about it, anytime you're doing anything up here, if you're playing music, whatever, you just feel like you're risking that, that, uh, those people's opinions of you. That's a scary thing, right? And that often keeps us um, from meeting people. Um, so, Oh, I got this in the wrong order. Anyways, we need to make space in our lives, uh, distancing ourselves from our important tasks. We have important things to do, um, but we need to make space. Um, I think the more important that we think we are, the harder it is to make space to go and meet people. I've got important things to do. Um, This is where humility makes a big difference as well. I need to humble myself and remember that though all those people out there are at least as important as I am. That young lady at the drive-thru, God loves her and values her and has a tremendous plan for her life. She's going to do awesome things for Jesus um, if she knows about Him and says yes. Better than me. And far more years than me. Like there's just so much potential there, so much value there. I got to remember that in my business and busyness, excuse me. Um, I also need to remember some important truths in order to not let my fear control me. Um, I got to remember that we are God's amazing creations, um, that I've been designed to relate to others and enjoy them. Like, that's part of my purpose, and that requires uh, meeting new people. Um, Yes, there are mean and rude and distracted people out there. We've met some of them. Most of them are on the the internet. Um, and they won't respond to our attentions. Uh, But the biblical truth about our relationships with God is that that, um, love has the power to overcome that fear. And sometimes I need just a really practical little thing to remember. Um, There was a a, a TV show, Saturday Night Live, which I never watched as a kid. I heard about because um, I was never allowed to stay up late enough to watch Saturday Night Live, but everyone else apparently did, so they, they would tell me about it. But I remember one thing, uh, which was uh, daily affirmations with Stuart Smalley. He would kind of finish his look at thing and look in the mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And uh, it sounds silly, but you know what? That's actually closer to the truth than our fears of what people will think, right? Like, people actually like you. Um, you're probably here with somebody. You know people here. We like each other here. Um, that's not an accident. Um, that's what God made us to do and to enjoy. And so we can go. We can meet people. Uh, and we can encourage and help each other uh, to do that. Um, second thing we need to do in addition to meeting people is we need to make friends with people. Um, uh, of course, meeting people is necessary, but the next step is just as important, making friends. Um, In my experience, uh, sharing the gospel is more often than not an ongoing conversation um, rather than a one-time presentation. We often think of sharing the gospel as, I mean, present something to you, and I have done that, and that's good as well, but more often than not, it's an ongoing conversation. I can think of a couple people where I sat down and shared the gospel with them, and then I sat down and I shared the gospel with them, 
And then I sat down and I shared the gospel with them. And that was just the process uh, of helping them through that. In the meantime, I was there with them. I was listening to their struggles, mourning with them when their their father passed away. Um, And so one of the keys to sharing the gospel is making friends, building uh, relationships. Because I think friendships are the context for the gospel. That's what helps the gospel make sense. When Jesus sent His disciples out in Matthew 10, I don't know if you recall, there's a couple times when He sent out His disciples, um, He said He wanted them to stay with those who were worthy until it's time to depart. Um, They didn't just go and talk to a bunch of random people. They found a household, and they stayed with that household until it was time to move on to the next thing. That means that those people who heard the good news um, didn't just get to uh, hear it and hear the message. They also got to see it at work in the lives of the people uh, who were bringing the good news. They were spending their lives together at least uh, for a short time. Um, I'm sure you've heard the saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's true, right? Um, When they know that you love them, they have an understanding of maybe what God's love means for them as well. Uh, When they see your sincerity and authenticity, which they can only experience in a relationship, then they can also understand that you're you that this gospel that you're talking about has impacted your life, and you're sharing with something that was beneficial to you as well. Um, So, um, here's a couple how-to tips for making friendships. You probably know all these. Um, First one is is to pursue people. People want to be pursued. You can be sure of this because you love it when people think of you and invite you to something. Do you like to be invited to something? Do you like it when people think about you and send you a quick note? Of course you do. Uh, so does everybody else. Uh, regardless of how they respond to it, people want to be pursued. They want to know that they have value. Uh, they want to be enjoyed by other people. Um, maybe, maybe not uh, telemarketers and spammers, right? You probably don't want to be pursued by somebody who has a great deal on auto insurance uh, or on... Uh, oh the warranty. Your warranty ran out. By the way, I want you to know your warranty ran out. Um, uh, you probably heard that before. Um, but sincere people who want to bless you instead of get something from you, um, you, want, you like those people in your life. A second practical thing is that we want to invite people into our lives. Share what you're doing with other people. I remember um, we had a couple apple trees in our yard when we lived up in Hancock, and I didn't, they just made a mess on the yard because they made apples, they fell down, hard to mow, and so I thought, wow, we should do something with the apples, and so I invited some students over, it's like, hey, can you uh, pick up the apples, and uh, maybe you can uh, chuck them against the back concrete wall, right, that'll be fun, and uh, we did that, and the ones that were still good, we picked them and brought them inside, and we uh, we just made apple-y things with them, apple cobbler, and then eventually we graduated to apple butter and apple jelly and other things. And, and finally, after a few years, this turned into apple palooza. Uh, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Um, and, uh, and by the time I left, students are like, well, who's going to do apple palooza when you leave? Well, what do you mean who's going to do apple palooza? I just did that because it was fun. <laughs> Like, it doesn't have to be a thing, but they loved it so much, all because I just took something that I was doing and I invited people along. That isn't, I I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like that great of a thing, but because I enjoyed it and shared it, um, it made an impact on people, uh, strangely. Um, The last thing is we want to do is in in building a friendship is be authentic. Uh, Don't hide what's important to you in order to build a friendship. No one wants a relationship with a fake person, Right? Um, they want the real you, even with your blemishes and rough edges. Um, this also means we shouldn't wait for the right moment to start talking about Jesus. Now is always the right time to start talking about Jesus with people around us. doesn't mean we have to launch into a gospel presentation, but hey, if Jesus is important to you, you kind of expect that to leak out somehow. And that's the kind of relationship people want to have with us. Uh, third thing. I have no idea how long I've been talking. <laughs> uh, it gets faster. Um, third thing is we want to get into conversations about Jesus. Uh, I love uh, Romans 1.16. Paul writes, I, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, uh, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, good news, which is actually what the word gospel means, is something that's always worth sharing with others, especially when it's good news for them. Hey, 
I've got good news, right? I want you to tell you about something, two things that I learned this week that might be helpful to you. One is I found uh, a CD that earns better than 4% interest over five years, right? I mean, some of you, you're like, okay, I don't know what you just said. But some of you are like, oh, wow, that's really good. That, I mean, and, and I'm serious about that. Like, if you want to know more about that, I'd be happy to share with you. So talk to me afterwards. Um, this, that's good news. Like, if I can help you earn more money with the money you have, then that's good news. Um, likewise, uh, I don't know if you knew this, probably too late, but when you file your 2020 taxes, uh, the IRS says, hey, you can, if you, uh, if you take the standard deduction and uh, you, can, you can actually uh, get a credit for $300 of charitable donations. If you give $300 to this church, to his house, to something else, um, then you can get a deduction for that. I don't know if you knew that, but if you didn't, that's good news, right? Because that because that's helpful to you. Well, that's, I, I'm just sharing you something that I know that I learned is beneficial to me, might be beneficial to you. That's not the gospel, um, but it's good news. I, when I tell you about Jesus, I'm just telling you the same thing. Jesus has made a profound impact in my life. He's changed it for the better unimaginably, far more than I could realize. Um, not only is my life better now, it'll be better for eternity. I understand what's good, and I love what's good, and he has, he has changed me, and He can do the same thing for you. I promise, not that your life is going to be easy, but your life is going to be better uh, through knowing Jesus. Like, I'm just sharing you with the good news that I know, um, and I'd love to talk about your specific context, right? Um, so, one of the things we want to do when we talk about Jesus is that assume, we need to assume that the people around us want to hear something about God desiring good for them. Like, people want to hear good news, and that good news includes things about Jesus, right? Um, another important thing to do is give credit where it is due. Tell people where you learned it. I learned it from the Bible. You can read the Bible. You can understand this about, about God. Um, Another important thing to do is we need to ask questions and listen to the answers. Uh, and it's good to ask deeper questions, questions about values, purpose, passions, the meaning of life. All those things are going to lead to some conversation a little bit about God. Uh, so don't forget in your conversations to ask why. Be like a three-year-old. Why? 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 Um, another thing, don't be afraid of conversations when you don't have all the answers. Your job is not to inform the ignorant, um, but to help people engage with their Creator. just want to introduce you to the Jesus that I know. I'm not trying to inform you. I'm just trying to build this relationship. Um, uh, the fourth thing is uh, we want to communicate relevantly about the gospel. It's kind of related to what I said. Um, like I said before, the gospel is good news. It's always good news, but it really can only be understood if as good news if it meets a need in a person's life, right? I told you about the, the CD, right? If you don't have cash, if you're just trying to make ends meet, you're not interested in a CD. That's not going to help you. I can't earn interest on money that I don't have, right? Um, so that's not the kind of news that you need if that's the situation you're in. Uh, you need different good news. But the good news about Jesus always meets a core need because there's one thing that's always true. Our problems always have sin at the root. Mine, yours, everybody in the world. Sin is always the problem. Jesus, uh, in some way, uh, is the answer, um, and He wants to help, and He can help. Uh, and so, we're addressing a core need that people have. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jesus talking with the, with the woman at the well. John chapter 4, right? So he goes into Samaritan village. He runs into this woman. He asks her to give him water. They have a great uh, discussion. And it's a good discussion to read because um, he, Jesus uncovers a foundational need in her life. Uh, this woman was not loved or respected by anyone. Not by her husbands, plural. There are many of them. Not by her village. She had to go in the heat of the day to get water. She certainly wasn't respected by Jews. She was a Samaritan. And she had some serious doubts whether God loved her and saw her needs. But Jesus saw her, uh, spoke to her, He listened to her, and He gave her hope. This is what He said. He says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. The 
Father is seeking such people to worship Him. That, that is Jesus saying to this woman, the Father is seeking you. He wants you. He values you. He loves you, and He wants you with Him. Uh, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Um, so Jesus told this woman that God was seeking her out, that He wanted her to become part of His people. He invited her to know and devote herself to this God who loved her and saw her. Um, and this, this uh, decision for, uh, that, she, that she made to devote herself to this God and this Messiah, Jesus, was life-changing. She moved from being a pariah, an outcast in her village, to being their messenger of hope. You know what happened when she went back to her village and told everybody about Jesus? They actually followed her. They actually came and went with her. Uh, she had to be as surprised as anybody. Uh, so that's a good example uh, as well. Um, uh, last thing here um, is uh, we want to invite a, a life-changing response. So our, our goal in making disciples isn't to get to people to agree to a set of principles, right? Not, I don't want you to have a checklist, say, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. Uh, our goal in sharing the gospel is to lead people into a whole new way of living life. Uh, see, the gospel doesn't just secure a place in heaven for us. It doesn't just save us from hell. It saves us from sin, and sin is a problem right now. Uh, when we say yes to Jesus, we're asking Him to rescue us from slavery to sin, and He does this by providing us with truth, with power over sin uh, through His Holy Spirit, and with strength and encouragement from His people, the church. Um, it's not just fire insurance, as they say. Uh, we're offering a radical uh, new life lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's why, I think that's one, one of the reasons why uh, baptism is not just an initiation ceremony, not just something you, you go through in order to get uh, in to heaven. Uh, baptism is actually a death and a rebirth, right? We don't need a new religion we need to have our sinful self die and then be born again from above. That is our actual need, and that's how Romans 6, for example, talks about baptism. Um, uh, so, um, there we go. That's just a little bit of, of how we think about, um, and I want to say I've kind of talked more about the meeting new people, but, but, but discipleship keeps going on. Uh, we want to help people in their walk with Jesus, uh, regardless of where they start. Uh, and so, uh, we often think of evangelism and discipleship as two different things, but they're really the same thing. It's just discipleship with someone who doesn't know Jesus, we call that evangelism, uh, because they need to hear the good news before they can, they can live it out. Um, good. Well, thank you um, for listening to me. I hope it was encouraging for you, um, and uh, it's certainly fun for me as well. I want to remind you of a couple things. One is if you want to help us get uh, te new technology so we can reach college students better, that is still an opportunity. I believe you can even do that on the, on the church app, right? That's what I heard this morning, which is so cool. Um, uh, and the second thing is if you want to help us reach students at the University of Michigan, uh, go to cyclethecampus.org. Um, that will be helpful. Um, uh, you, this is a video that's available online, uh, and you can also, uh, I can give instructions for anybody who wants so they can share it to social media and different things like that, uh, but we could use your help there. And lastly, I have these cool magnets for you. I have a huge pile of them, so if you at all want this for yourself or you want to give it away to somebody, I have them for you. Just got to ask me for them. They're back at the little table there with a the big, big hiss house sign there. So, um, thanks. I'm going to pray real quick. And the next thing will happen. Uh, Father, um, I'm excited about uh, your work in, in, in my life, and I want to share that with people around me. And I know that's true uh, for us as well, Lord. Sometimes we don't feel uh, equipped. Sometimes we don't feel ready. Sometimes we're scared, God. And I just want you to walk with us. Give us uh, power from your Holy Spirit, uh, truth from your word, encouragement from the people around us uh, to walk, trusting you that this is good news for everybody. Uh, Lord, we pray um, that you be at work uh, in our lives, uh, in this community, uh, on college campuses, so that people know you uh, and uh, that your kingdom is, is grown uh, beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen.